No! No! Can you hear the sound of my voice? Good, good. I have to practice again. Getting it right up on my mouth. Boy, I leave for a couple of weeks and everything changes. The tables, are, the refreshments were not in the same place. The tables were changed. Oh, and then you had this weather event. No. I hated missing that. <laughs> um, a few announcements. So things changed a little bit with our program because of the weather event. And so our speaker, Mike Gunther, is going to do his program in three weeks instead of four. So today and next week. And then we'll pick up again uh, as scheduled with Carla Erickson, uh, the sociologist, coming as scheduled. Chris French, who is going to come next, has kindly agreed to move to May 1st. So, but we're not going to miss Chris, we'll just see him later on, when we aren't going to experience any polar vortexes in May. Okay. Um, so here are the usual reminders. If you've got a tea coil, it's time to start using it. If you've got a phone with you, would you either put it on vibrate or turn it off? You'll have a chance to catch up on your mail or uh, phone calls at break time. And uh, Mike has said that he'll take a few questions probably right before break and then a question and answer period towards the end. I'll be running around with the microphone. Uh, would you wait for the mic? And also, if you can remember it, I often can't. Just say your name, it's just helpful for him, for everybody else in the room, and for future listeners if you do that at question time. Mike, we welcome you back. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for coming out on a really cold and icy day uh, and for putting up with uh, delays and whatnot. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, an evolutionary perspective. Uh, just to remember, because it seems to me like years ago, the first lecture, <laughs> my goal was to use the history of computing in some ways to kind of give us a way to think beyond what is our normal conception of technology as being solely the domain of engineering science and rationality, and instead remind us of the world of delight, of unexpected developments, um, pleasure, and of the interesting and I think really diverse cast of characters that have participated to create technology. And so um, today I'm going to be returning to the study of history a bit, but, um, but focusing on different aspects um, and kind of talking about evolution. And then uh, for the next week's session, I'm going to kind of combine a lot of different topics. And I think it'll be a lot of fun. We're going to look at different facets of technology from um, kind of the life cycle of um, where does technologies go when they become obsolete, what are some different ways that psychologists, others have taught us to think about technology. So it'll be a lot of kind of different perspectives. Um, so I want to start with the most ancient of tools, the hammer. Um, and if anyone is in Haines, Alaska, or in that part of Alaska, I definitely recommend going to the Hammer Museum. It's, it's hard to admit, not not hard or yeah hard to miss because it has a 35 foot hammer outside of it. Um, and it has it's the world's only hammer museum. But one of the things I love about this museum, and I'm going to put a plug shamelessly for the Grinnell Historical Museum as well, which also has a wonderful collections of tools that they're working to mount. Um, I find it really fascinating that when people go to create collections of tools, they often discover things. They discover patterns. They discover connections. Um, the same thing happened in the scientific world when people first started to create herbariums or to create large collections of natural shells, plants, and insects. They started to discover that there was kind of a seemingly order of pattern to nature. And so just as many of the ideas of evolution that came out of the scientific world were rooted in collection and taxonomy, the same thing happened with the what I call the artificial world, the world of made things. Um, that they started to, as they collected things, start to see patterns. Um, and I think hammers hold a special place in understanding tools. Uh, Karl Marx once said that the, one of the things he could at least understand was how Birmingham, when he visited it, how they could sell 500 different types of hammers. It kind of stunned him to think about that. Uh, and so I think that the, the sheer diversity um, of items, but also how did we get to this world with all of these tools? And, and it's interesting in ways that some kinds of hammers seem to 
show a kind of long evolution over the course of the oldest hand go back to about two million years, but um, to see this long kind of chain of links over the course of time um, can be really interesting um, with tools. Um, and I think I mentioned this in class, one of the ways that anthropologists usually kind of sort societies is by the Copper Age, the Iron Age, the Stone Age, and things like that. All those categories were created by the first museums as they tried to struggle with how to make order of all these artifacts and stuff. So, um, so I think finding large collections of items, like whether it's a museum of appliances or a museum of tools or historic, I think museums and collections have a really important place in letting us think about the vast array, as that Pablo Neruda poem I read um, on the first week, that ocean of things, like when we can see them all gathered in one place, it gives us a sense of the scale and the diversity and the scope of made items. Um, and so in my class, The Evolution of Technology, uh, one of the things that I try to talk about is why is it important to study the past? Um, and to study, especially from not only history, but like kind of from an evolutionary perspective, are there laws governing the evolution of technologies just as there seem to be laws governing the evolution of plants and animals and the living world? Um, and it's also to get away from one of the things that kind of is tied to the perceptions on the first lecture, but what I call here the myth of the heroic inventor, and kind of a myth of revolutionary change. We, we tend as a culture to be obsessed with change, rupture, innovation, and we tend to put in a lot on sole figures who we think of as geniuses. So people like James Watts that we'll talk about today, the inventor of the steam engine. Um, here in America, I think Eli Whitney, right? What school child hasn't learned about? Eli Whitney and the cotton gin, the device that changed the course of American history. So we tend to focus on those handful of devices, uh, Ford with the car, that seem to literally change the course of history and were created by these uh, heroic inventors. Um, and so one of the things I want to talk about today is what that perspective misses. And one of the things it misses is the deep history of antecedents that laid the groundwork for transformative invention. So to take the example of Eli Whitney, um, it's not to take any credit away from the cleverness and the important way he developed a new kind of cotton gin, but there were centuries of traditions of cotton gins, um, going all the way back to the first century BC, uh, and around the world, as we talked about in the first lecture. Um, in fact, we know that Whitney looked at Indian, what are called charkas, which are these special kind of rolling gins that are used to separate the seeds from cotton. Um, and the same with almost any device. Like, it's very hard to find a device that springs full formed out of the mind of someone, that doesn't build on dozens of prior examples or prior parts or components or <laughs> techniques. So I think it's really important to study, and we'll look at some case studies today that I think will hopefully be interesting to you, things like the bicycle, things like telegraphs, um, uh, typewriter, everyday things that you might be surprised how deep their histories go back and how much this process of building one on top of the other is really important. Um, uh, this is, I guess, just to kind of even drive home a little bit of a moral or kind of um, interpretive point, which is taking the long view and evolutionary view reminds us about the collective contributions. Again, not to say that inventors aren't important, but to, to understand how they build on the work of others. I think Isaac Newton in the realm of science said it best once when he said, if I've seen farther than any, it's because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. And he was trying to say that he built on the collective work of centuries of different people who had given, created the tools for him to do his exploration. I think we need something like that in the world of technology, um, and especially in Silicon Valley with a, almost a cult of the young inventor, the Steve Jobs, you know, the other kinds of peoples, um, I think needs to be tempered. Um, this, I guess, goes back a little bit to some of the issues that we talked about in the first week, but where is it that the actual creativity resides in the invention process. Because I'm going to try to talk that it's not just moments of like inspiration, it's usually applying something from a different field to it and about like, combining different things. Um, so I wonder, so that's something we're going to kind of talk about today. Um, and then one of the things that I especially am interested in is all the different devices that were kind of um, existing and that eventually lost out and sometimes in competition. So we're going to look at the examples of bicycles and other things, telegraphs, and you, I think many of you, if you don't know that particular device well, will be surprised to know how many different versions there were, how many different paths people were developing for these items. 
each of which had their own interesting kind of evolutionary lines and different social groups that were invested in one particular form of a bicycle versus another. Um, and so I think it's one of the best things to go back in the past is to remind ourselves that there were just all these different items out there. Um, and lastly, this is something with interesting policy and kind of political and economic um, considerations or implications. So if there are multiple paths and we tend to choose certain ones, there's an argument that that kind of locks us in to particular design paths, which can have really important economic um, and political implications. And I'll talk about that with some of the examples. But I would just say that like the Supreme Court in the 90s was deciding all these different important cases with like Microsoft and um, accusations of monopoly power. And more importantly, there were arguments being made that if Microsoft is allowed to develop the most successful platform that edges everything else out, then we're going to be locked into that path, and there's no possibility for competition. So we need to think about monopoly just as not just as a formal way that you can buy up everyone, but that you can develop the sole technique or platform or technology that pushes everyone out. And so if any of you remember back to the 80s, this is kind of a more practical example, but the battle between Betamax and VHS, right? There are a lot of people that said Betamax was a better system, but I was amazed to find out that Betamax just stopped production two years ago. Like they were still making them. Um, so we'll get into that maybe next week about the long life of technologies. But on everyday things about these different kinds of platforms, the cars we drive, I'm going to talk at the end about the refrigerators we use, there were often multiple choices. Um, and it's not that we, the consumers, always make the choice. Often companies make choices about what lines to pursue. But that can have huge implications. And in fact, one of the things that people often talk about is that when Microsoft was in the middle of these suits, they decided not to buy a new upstart company that they were looking to buy and kind of put, put to the side, which was Google. They planned to buy Google, and they were just going to kind of bury it in some subsection. But because they were under such scrutiny by the federal government, they decided not to do that. So imagine a world in which Google had not been created, right? So a lot of economists are kind of talking about, we live in a particular world that is shaped by the paths and decisions made decades or centuries ago in terms of technology. So that's something really interesting, I think, to grapple with and to think about. Um, like I said, I'll hope to make this kind of more concrete and engaging with some common examples. I just have up here a painting that I think captures, uh, was done in the mid-19th century when the idea of the heroic inventor first starts to take place, because we have, in the 19th century, the development of a robust patent system, where people can actually patent their ideas, and more importantly, a cultural celebration with the Industrial Revolution that inventors are the people who create the technologies that, um, that lift nations and, and transform the economies, and that they're not just mechanics or tinkerers, but that they're really, really important figures. And this painting has uh, James Watts, as you see, staring at a teacup. And now, I think it's important because there's often this idea of like kind of moments of inspiration, and that he gets his ideas of seeing the teapot boil over, and he's starting to think about, well, what if I put a condenser on a steam engine I could transform it? Um, and in behind him, it's dark on this image, but behind him is an actual steam engine. And, uh, but anyway, like I said, Eli Whitney and James Watt, to me, are two great examples of people who are seen as single-handedly kind of transforming um, technology in their ways. And we, we want to put them in a, a larger kind of context. But I'm going to start, I guess. You're a little bit loud. I don't know if anybody else has a problem with that. Okay, great, thanks. Let me adjust this, yeah. Um, how does this sound? Is this a little better as far as not kind of spinning into the mic? Or? Let's see. Yeah. Does this sound good? Yeah. Do people? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and anyone else raise their hand if I'm not dropping my consonants or not speaking up loudly or speaking too loudly into the mic? Um, so I want to start with an example of the, the telegraph here. And Samuel Morse is another one of these figures who was kind of celebrated as this inventor, and he famously sent the first telegraph in 1844 between Baltimore and Washington, um, and the line, which I'll show you here, is in the Smithsonian, uh, just part of it on this ticker tape, What Hath God Wrought, um, which I think is such an apropos line, right? It's this moment in which he's saying, like, you know, what, what have we done? We have unleashed, and this is the period when the myth of Prometheus becomes especially popular, and the idea of Prometheus as technology. We've unleashed unheard of technology that will transform the world. Um, and so most Americans, and I won't do a poll here, but if you ask most people who invented the telegraph, they would say Morse, right? 
right? Um, he kind of came up with this idea. Obviously, who would have had a telegraph before electricity, before the 1840s or 50s? Um, so that's the kind of our common understanding that you'll find in textbooks. But I want to talk about the kind of way that he built on. He himself had actually seen telegraphs in Europe 12 years earlier in France, electric telegraphs, and so he was trying to develop new ideas. If anything, what he's probably most important in terms of contribution was developing his kind of code system, although that's only one way of doing it. Uh, but uh, he also, just to kind of point out about how things change, most of you, if you imagine your mind Morse code, you imagine someone with a, uh, listening to the little beeps, the dee -dee -dee -dee, you know, this is a Western Telegraph person here. The original one, as you can see, is actually a tape-written system. It's a system of kind of marks punctured on paper. Only later did the people using it decide that that was really annoying and that they could actually hear the sound, and so they stopped reading the paper and listened to the sound and figured out how to do that. So um, one, I guess one of the things I'd say is the iconic form it took was developed not by Morse, but by the people who were using it, who just amplified the sound. Um, but let me get to the main kind of point about what that builds on. Um, and here's an engraving from 1859 that I kind of personally love, about the electric telegraph then and now. It shows an array of some of the different devices um, that were developed, um, and we'll kind of go into some of these items, but I just want you to think about, again, that with every technology, there's usually a crowded field of all different ways to achieve that goal, with different groups proposing them, all evolving out of different traditions of tools and items or different fields of knowledge or different professions. Um, but we can trace the telegraph actually back to, I don't know if any of you have heard of the optical telegraphs that were developed in the 18th century. So this starts in the 1790s. Um, these are developed and kind of widely instituted throughout France during the Napoleonic period. Um, it's developed by Claude Schapp. Um, they're often called two semaphores, or many of you probably know semaphore signaling from naval vessels or airplanes and stuff. That grows out of this tradition of these telegraphs that go back to the 18th century. Um, it had these signaling arms that you can see up here, and here is the alphabet, so you would move these arms in different forms, modeled on the human body and on cards that were popular in the 18th century. If any of you seen the alphabet cards of children that are like shaping their body to be different letters? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, no. but anyway, it, it's interesting where people get kind of germinal ideas. Uh, but anyway, so we have a system in which you can, on the top of a particular tower, um, and I'll show you a modern version. They're still existing throughout France today. On the top of the tower is this large signaling device that can be uh, do letters of the alphabet, and there's like one of these towers every five to 20 kilometers, depending on how high they are. They are. And there's someone else watching with a telescope to record this um, and to move the signal along the line. Um, and here is a map of the network that was built in France. So it's quite a large network. And these existed all throughout the world, actually. And in fact, you'll often see the clue that a place, like in San Francisco, Telegraph Hill, that neighborhood, that's because tele optical telegraphs were put there to, re to signal um, incoming shipping. Like all along the east, west coast would have been optical telegraphs in the US. And places throughout Europe had optical telegraphs running until the early 20th century. Um, because they were easy to use as far as not having electricity. Um, there are limits. It's hard to do them at nighttime, obviously. Uh, <laughs> the but let me just give you the speed of a message during France in 1800 was 13 and 80, 1300 kilometers per hour. So they basically could send a message from one part of France to the other side in about uh, 15 or 20 minutes or something like that. Um, as they move along, they'd have one person recording the message, one signaling, another signaling to the next station. So. Um, so it's an amazing kind of device, and again, it kind of surprises you. You're like, wow, there's telegraphs even before electricity. Um, and then we can go a little bit further. When I was at the Royal Society in London uh, a couple of years ago, I was doing research, and I was digging through papers, and I saw this title that jumped out at me from 1680, from Robert Hooke, who was a famous scientist, Discourse Showing a Way How to Communicate One's Mind at a Great Distance. Um, and it wasn't a paper that was published, it's just in the collection. And then we have these images, these are the folders I was looking at. And it's the same thing, he's suggesting to build an optical telegraph that could be um, send messages you know, back and forth. Um, and I'm sure that there's other examples, and we could even get into things like talking drums or drum signals. I mean, there's a, there's a long tradition that these different inventors are building on. But so we could say that in important ways the telegraph goes back, um, and here's his particular coding system that he was working on. But we could say that the telegraph 
um, goes back 200 years or so, right? Um, and there's a concept that uh, I don't usually try to use specialized vocabulary, but I think this one's important: skeuomorphism. This concept that's in anthropology and design, which is basically um, the idea that people, when trying to do difficult and new things, look to the past and incorporate the methods of the past to achieve them. Right? So there's classic examples from the ancient world when the Greeks started building stone temples. If you've ever been seen, or if you were familiar with Greek dentals, like in decorative friezes, right? Those are actually leftovers from when they built their temples out of wood a particular design style. So when they started to build in stone, there was no need to have those there, but they kept them there because that's what they considered to be what people expected and how they did it. Another example, kind of more modern, when the British started building iron bridges, like Copedale, the first famous bridge, it's always portrayed as revolutionary, right? The first iron bridge, the beginning of the industrial age. If you look at how they made it, they actually dovetailed all the metal pieces to fit just as if it was done with wood. And instead of doing rivets, they did iron screws. So like they basically used all the techniques and the model for which they were comfortable in order to accomplish something at a totally different medium. And that would change, but you see that a lot with technologies. People work with what they know. Um, and then sometimes it's cultural, like the Greek example or today. I always wonder what, what younger people think when their phone clicks when they take a picture, right? That sound of a shutter. There's obviously no shutter in the camera. There's no need to have a clicking sound. But we want that sound there because culturally we expect it. And so there's this interesting tradition. So we, we see a side in which we see the cultural aspects of technology. We want things that are comfortable to us, that we know how to use. And in fact, if you're a designer, inventor, you probably want to design something. Something that builds on people's cultural knowledge and their expectations. But also, like I said, there's this aspect of kind of the inventive and creative side. If you're going to tackle a new problem like building an iron bridge, you're going to use the tools that you have or the techniques. And so that's really important to understanding how people make things. And so let me give you an example. When we get the first telegraphs, electrical telegraphs, right? They look just like optical telegraphs. So this is the French Foy uh, and Brugot telegraph. And the telegraph operator grabs these handles and turns them. And it moves a series of arms that look just like that optical telegraph, right? So that's kind of the way they figured this out. And you'll see this with all kinds of devices that we'll be talking about today. People build on the past in order to kind of tackle the challenges of the future. Um, now, Brugo, some of you may have heard of it. It's a famous Swiss watchmaking company here today. So Foy was the optical telegraph director, and he worked with a watchmaker to create those first series of telegraphs. Rougeau decided, you know what, I, want, I can do things better, I'm a clock maker, I'm going to make a telegraph like a clock. And so you see here one of his early designs. I'll show you um, another example. So you have a dial that you turn to the different letters and hit a button and it sends that signal. And then the person who might be like five miles away, this needle moves to show them what the letter is. Right? So he's using all of his kind of tools and, and, and his techniques and what he's comfortable with as a clockmaker to make a very popular design. This kind of travels all around the world um, and in important ways fits into Asian cultures and other languages better than the Morse code um, with the system of dots and dashes. So here's a picture in Japan that you'll see someone using one of these Brugo telegraphs um, where they, they just add characters to the dial and kind of change things. But, um, so actually, Morse's telegraph was popular in some parts of Europe and America, but actually around the world, other models fit in better. And it's one of the exciting things when you study a technology is to see which different competing paths succeed in other cultures and in other times and places here. Um, and we'll talk about some of the early typewriters, especially European and international, follow this model. Rather than punching keys, you turn dials, because that's what people were used to telegraphs. The British had a system, because of, and it goes into what they were used to in the 18th century, but they wanted a system of needles that would point to letters. So all the British telegraphs until the 1880s involved a system of needles and letters. Uh, and we could just kind of go on. There's all these different models. But each one of them, if you look into their history, it comes out of where the particular manufacturer and the supporters were coming out of. If they were people in the clock industry, they designed one kind of thing. If there were people in woodworking or manufacturing another. People related to the trains might have a different set of mechanisms. Um, one that I wanted to show that also gives a kind of good example is they started developing writing telegraphs. Um, and you can kind of see, I think, pretty easily what these resemble. Right? They look like 
keyboards or harpsichords or club, right? So um, they start developing, there's a whole line, here's another example, uses printing telegraph. So you're gonna cut out the middleman, you don't need to have a skilled operator here. And that's one important thing, These, each system has a different social implication. One, like Morris, might require a skilled operator. Only the operator can listen to the code, translate it, right? This kind of device, any person can push the keys. Um, and in fact, what we'll see is this becomes the basis down the road for uh, stenographs and stenography and stenotypists, like in, who use chords. They press multiple keys at a time, just like a musical instrument has chords. So this is an important design path, even though this does not become the most popular telegraph in the world, right? It's gonna lay the basis 100 years later for a revolutionary type of typing in a different system here. And again, it's someone using, um, we have a 28 key piano style, in order to create a telegraph that you just type the letters and then on the other side that ticker tape prints out the letters, actually. Um, now one of the complicated things is they have to figure out how, <coughs> they have to figure out how to coordinate the timing of these devices and how to make them run. And so I'm showing you the underside of that particular keyboard because I think it's really important that they, that device and some other ones used clock makers and pendulums and weights to drive the device and to try to synchronize multiple devices. So if you have devices run by pendulums with careful transmission of time, you can synchronize your message, if that makes sense, and you can send it in an orderly way. Um, so there they're building on hundreds of years of clock making skills, um, which leads us to maybe the most surprising, the Victorian fax machine. Now, if you know that people were faxing drawings and images um, as early as the 1860s. So here is one of the first faxes. This is like the equivalent of what we saw in Morse's, you know, what hath God wrought. This is um, a drawn image, and you can see that I've zoomed up on it so you can see the lines where it's been kind of scanned. Um, actually, they started even in the 1830s, earlier on. The ones I'm going to show you are the more successful ones. Um, Alexander Baines, and especially there's an Italian, um, Giovanni Caselli, who invented this large fax machine in the 1870s. So it uses pendulums, uh, and clock devices to synchronize with another item. Um, you draw with one pen and it transmits it to the other. Uh, and so these originally are ones that you have to actually draw the item for. It was often used for signatures, for banks and other things. You would fax your signature. Um, then they developed devices just 10 years later to be able to scan the actual item to use a kind of special electric sensitive ink. So as the rod goes over the paper, whenever it hits any ink, it transmits an electrical signal. Whenever it hits paper without ink, it transmits no signal, and so that gets sent to the other side. So, uh, so again, you know, people are developing these long evolutionary histories. And so the fax machine goes back 200 years, practically, different techniques, people trying um, to work on them. So I think, you know, especially for a lot of my students who, you know, whose memory only goes back 10 years, it's, it's both exciting and a lot of fun to discover the deep history behind objects. And so one of the assignments in the class is for them to pick something they really like, an object that they, you know, something like that Neruda would, you know, write an ode to. Something, that's something you really care about, a personal item. And again, it doesn't have to be high technology, just what is an, an artifact, a technology you want to use, and trace how far back you can go with it. And like I said, they're all, often quite surprised. It's a fun exercise to do. I encourage any of you to consider that, to look you know, into something that you like, whether it's your, for me, it might be my KitchenAid mixer. It's one of my most loved <laughs> items. I should look into the history of it. And you'll find both a long trajectory, a long arc of people experimenting, but also you'll find particular items within your device, particular types of gears or particular techniques for using materials, that those have even deeper history. That's usually part of the story of how the device came about. So, part of what I'm saying and getting at this idea, and I remember George actually asked a question about this uh, at the end of last session, is what, what we learned from the computer that what creates in innovation, what is the spark of creativity, is taking something from one field and applying it to another. And so that's definitely an argument that people who take this evolutionary perspective really think is important and for all of us to understand. So, one of the people, Brian Arthur, who's a Economist, um, he's at, kind of at Stanford University, and he's written this book, *The Nature of Technology*. That's one of a number of books that looks at the evolutionary aspects. But it's something that he really highlights as like the core insight. Like I've put up here, you know, one of his quotes: "Every novel technology is created from a new combination 
or configuration of existing ones, always. Right? So like everything that's new, and there are new things, they all have to come out of existing materials, techniques, parts, um, gadgets that already exist. And so he's like, this is like the foundational for doing geometry. This is the axiom number one upon which you build all understandings of technology. Um, and if you do that, the implications, I'm just read some of his quotes, like every technology stands upon a pyramid of others that made it possible in a succession that goes back to the earliest phases of human history. Right? So again, it gives us a sense of the sweep of the story and thinking about all of this as kind of a collective aspect. But there's other things. All future technologies will derive from those that now exist, perhaps in no obvious way. Right? And that's something interesting to think about. What's around us today will form the basis that will all be combined in ways that we cannot expect, we cannot understand, to create the technologies of the future. Right? They're, they're actually here now, the technologies of the future. Everything that's needed, which is something interesting to think about. This is obviously near and dear to my heart. History is important. Right? Um, and this is something I try to kind of explore with my students through different case studies. But if technology had appeared by chance in a different word, it means like in different time periods, the technologies built from them would have been different. So and I think I maybe I said something about this in the first session. <coughs> had the crankshaft appeared four centuries before it did, we might have a whole different order of technology. We might have had steam engines before we had you know, um, other items, or water wheels, or things like that. So timing is centrally important in terms of the evolution of technology, when things appear, why they appear. Um, we now think a lot differently about the centrality of an item like the spinning wheel. Uh, first of all, it's just important on its own right because it created so much cloth. It revolutionized how people could make fabric as opposed to a drop spindle. I mean, the average part, like today, I'm probably wearing, I think they said the average person wears two miles of thread in their clothing when it's woven. So imagine trying to make all that with a drop spindle. So, you know, there's arguments that the spinning wheel changed clothing, it changed the ability to have paper. You can't have pulp, like fabric, to make paper in the Middle Ages, or especially the printing press without all that fabric around. But more importantly, the spinning wheel created the first known working flywheel, a giant wheel that can absorb energy and then transmit it back to the system so that you don't have humps or dead spaces going up and down. So you, don't, you probably would not have a working steam engine that could do rotary motion without a spinning wheel or something before. So. Just so it makes us think differently about the connections between these items. And also what counts as important though. Because like I said, often we focus on the flashy things that supposedly transform society. But we might miss the, the one item that opens up a whole new suite of thinking about it in ge genealogical terms. It opens up a whole new suite of inventions decades, centuries later. Um, and I guess that's what comes to this last point. The value of technology lies not merely in what it can be done with it, but also in what future possibilities or paths it will lead to. Right? So again, we need to think about these objects in terms of what they make possible, like what kinds of evolutionary paths they open up. And so that's a very different way to kind of write history and to think about it. Um, it can make some really interesting, exciting stories to tell. Um, a little bit like what I was trying to do with the computer and uh, automatons and thinking about how out of that world comes technologies and ideas that will revolutionize computing. I think it also really clicks with, and this is an image from one of Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks, but the way engineers work and the way they think and the way they talk about their work, which is um, there's a long tradition of drawing and of recording interesting devices. And so as I talk, I'm just going to be showing some of the images from his notebooks, but the, there's almost a kind of grammar to invention and to technology that people go about recording, in this case, like ratchet devices. Leonardo here is blowing up a ratchet to look at all the different parts. And so that when they go to tackle a problem five or 10 years later, they go back to their notebooks and they look at it. They're building up an inventory of all different ways to think about um, devices here. So there's also a playful combinatorial aspect. So they're just like, well, what if I put a ratchet with this wheel and put some wings on it, kind of fly like a helicopter. And many of you are familiar with Da Vinci's kind of creative, playful imagery. Um, and most of the times it's seen as like he's predicting the future, which, which there's truth to that. But we also need to think about how what he's doing is playing and putting things together. Um, and in fact, in my Tech 154 class in the fall, we had a drawing instructor come in. And I had students draw a bunch of different item, 
items. And then they had to combine them in this kind of notebook fashion to create some new invention. <laughs> we did the same thing too with umbrellas, because I'm, I'm convinced we, we can do better with umbrellas. <laughs> <laughs> and it's an everyday device that everyone knows a failure. My umbrella gets me wet. My umbrella blows up in the wind. My umbrella is too wide when I walk in city streets. It hits everyone. They're too narrow on other times. I want an umbrella that can change width, right? So everyone, so they do an exercise where they have to interview another person to find out what's the problem with umbrellas for them. And they have to go into their kind of arsenal of devices and mechanisms and things they've drawn um, to imagine how they could create an umbrella. And that's usually that thing. They'll think, well, I saw this once with, with a you know, winch or a beach umbrella. And I'd like to try it on a hand umbrella or something like that. Um, and the most popular books that engineers from the 1600s on looked at were these theaters of machines, which just combined all these machines, some fanciful, some real built. My favorite, uh, the book wheel on the right. Uh, the right here it allows you to kind of like a Ferris wheel rotate it so you can look at multiple books at one time. Uh, but these are amazing books that show the both the imagination and creativity, but also, like I'm saying, show how you can combine all these different devices together to create your objects. Um, uh, and so in, even in engineering training in the 19th century, you would get books like this, Elements of Machines, where you have all these tables of like 600 ways to do a planetary gear, stuff, which are not nearly as fun as the other drawings. But again, these are the tools by which inventors will go about. And even everyday inventors, uh, that, like the woman who invented the washing machine and stuff like that, they're looking at these kinds of sources to figure out how do I create the rotating paddles to get agitation on the washing machine. And it's also a reminder again of that collective process, that using generations worth of inventions and clever ideas um, in order to create them. So I'm going to pause there um, and see if anyone has some questions. We're going to take a break in a second. When I come back, we'll talk about uh, some bicycles and some other things. But does anyone have any questions? Yeah, if you raise your hand and wait, and uh, Janet will come over. Uh, Greg Munns. Mike, if, as Arthur suggests, technological change is incremental, how is it that some devices are described as changing the course of history? Since <laughs> so there's two potential answers. This is a great question. Right? So there's two potential answers. One is that we often forget the incremental improvements that made it revolutionary. So we'll say, ah, the cotton gin. But then you'll notice, well, it took 20 years to perfect it so that it actually worked on scale. So there's some people that say what we do is we miss the micro invention. It's one thing to create a prototype. It's another to create a device that will work. And they'll say it's usually 20 or 30 years of slow evolutionary micro inventions that make device. I think there's some truth to that. And I think what others have said, and Arthur says this, is um, a device can be socially transformative all at once. It can create change, um, but it itself grew incrementally out of other prototypes. If that makes sense? So it would be like the computer, you know, you can trace all these evolutions, but we could say that there was one device, the Apple II, that really everyone used and that had social transformations and change. So they would distinguish between the technological world and the social world and say that there are particular devices that, yes, when they appear, they do transform everything, but, but they would argue not to lose that, lose sight of the longer thing. That's how they would respond. But yeah, there is tension. And I don't want to give up the idea that technology can make change, or that it's always a story or a continuum, but, yeah. I'm going to try and answer uh, for... I'm not sure very close well, to Greg's, Greg's question. Okay, good. George, Greg. I, I think that one of those transformational inventions that change the whole society, i.e. the stirrup. Ah, okay. yes. And the, the creation of the ICBM of the Middle Age, I, the knight on horseback. Yes. You couldn't find on horseback unless you had a stirrup. Right. When the stirrup was introduced, which hadn't been invented by the Europeans, I think, uh, it transformed the whole society. But it was a long evolution to create the kind of stirrup that would keep a very heavy, heavily uh, armored person on a horse. No, that's it, right. And uh, there's a famous book by Lynn White Jr. Medieval technology, uh, medieval technology and social change that was written in the '60s and it kind of blew everyone's mind because the Middle Ages is the last place you expect technology. And to talk about the, he argued that the origins of feudalism were, wasn't didn't lie with popes or kings or high politics. That it lied in the humble stir that was imported from Syria and from the steps of 
uh, Asia, and that allowed, as George was saying, heavily armored knights to fight. Uh, before that, people used horses, but they usually got off their horse to fight. Like, you didn't want to be on a horse where you're going to get knocked off. And so the stirrup was seen as allowing heavily armored knights who needed, they started developing huge war charger horses, like the Percherons, and, and then the, the, to pay for that, they needed to have manners that would be able to afford all that metal work, the horses. So his argument is that feudalism actually was just a, an adaptation to this revolution of warfare caused by, again, the humble stirrup. So now it's a great example. Now some people would push back and say, well, yes, the stirrup, but you also need the pummel, the cantle, you need the horse to be attached. And they would be like, if you look at, there's like about 100 years of careful evolution um, that applies, or even evolving the horse to match, the armor to match. So they would say, and so yes, I, but you're right, this is an example of a great example of something that transforms society. We're going to take a 10 minute break now. You all have a good time, and when you hear the bell, come back. <laughs> about these items of combinations and the way a lot of people, I said engineers, but really anyone who's a tinkerer, anyone who's kind of creating items, it's often someone who's collecting in their mind or in paper all these different devices that capture their attention, because they're useful, or sometimes they just love the elegant solution or the way someone creates a particular cantilever or something like that. Um, let me run quickly through it. another example. I'm going to come back to James Watt and the steam engine. Now, I could go backwards in time and talk about how Watt built on a 200-year tradition of other kind of steam, there were steam engines before James Watt and things like that. But instead, I want to talk about that notion of the unexpected paths that are opened up by kind of newer devices um, and how that leads, because I think it's interesting. And this steam engine has a lot of paths forward. Not only is it important because it creates work, energy and is important to the Industrial Revolution, but it leads to things like when I talk about the record player and lots of other kind of devices. So um, let me talk about a couple things that he faced, the, the challenges that he had to work through. Um, one is that he wanted his engine, unlike all previous steam engines, to work on both the upstroke and the downstroke here, because um, he created a separate condenser. We won't get into the details. But all previous steam engines had just used chains, like chain link chains, to connect two, um, two arms of the beam to do work. Um, and that was fine because it wasn't actually pushing up the the other side, if it makes sense, it's like a seesaw, right? Um, if you want the, the piston to actually push upwards, the chain is not going to work, right? You can't push a chain upward. Um, but you also can't attach a rod because this beam is moving in a kind of arc, right? Um, and the rod needs to go straight up and down. So he was facing this classic mechanical problem, like how do I connect an up and down rod to a swinging arc beam? Um, and he wasn't quite sure what to do about that. Let me just show you See if this works. I have a video here of the machine in motion. Um, and we'll look at it for a second. There's also a lot of really clever and interesting stuff where he connects all the in, intake and exhaust valves so that every time it goes up and down, it opens and closes. He's got to figure out how to bring fuel in and out, how to connect all these things. And of course, he's going to be drawing a lot on that automaton tradition that we talked about, with cams and levers and automated controls. Um, he's, but I wanted to show you that uh, what he was most proud of, let me see if I can move my cursor over to the screen. There we go, okay. Um, so what he's most proud of is this device of parallel linkages that allow him to connect that big beam, and we're going to see that in a second here. So this big swinging beam is connected by the series of parallelogram rods that allow that beam to move in an arc but yet continue to move the piece up and down. And it's a really important actually invention to, to, to be used on a lot of different engines and devices. It gets imported into everything like if you have a jewelry box and you open it up and all the trays stay parallel, or a fishing tackle box, right? That's actually kind of the same linking mechanism. So it gets incorporated into uh, sewing machines, all kinds of things. Um, but we could ask, where did, let me hit pause here for a second. We could ask, um, where did he get that idea from? How did he solve that particular problem? Well, Watts had been trained as a draftsman and a drawing master. 
Um, and he was familiar with a device that had been invented a couple of centuries before called the pantograph. I don't know, has anyone ever used or seen a pantograph? There was some of, sometimes people in drafting schools and things like that, right? So you attach one pin in the center that you trace over one drawing, and then the other pin gets attached to the far right side, and it makes it either bigger or smaller. You can set the ratios. It allows you to copy exactly whatever you're drawing like in whatever scale. So they're still used by architects today. They basically figured out I could attach that to my steam engine to get this kind of parallel motion. So that's like kind of one example of how he solved a particular problem by drawing on a very different tradition to figure something out. Um, but I also want to look at um, another item on here. Bear with me. Um, this is something that Actually, I, could, I was asked earlier if there's any devices that, that don't have antecedents, right? Um, and it was pointed out that actually a lot of chemical devices or chemical just constructions or creations, vulcanized rubber and things like that seem to have no antecedents and that true. The thing I'm going to show you doesn't seem to have an antecedent. It uses existing parts, but it's something that we don't know of any prior <laughs> thing, which is a pressure value, a pressure volume diagram. Watts wanted to know what was going on in his steam engine in terms of its efficiency. He couldn't look inside it, and so one day when he was watching the parts, we, um, it's over here, sorry. I, I don't know if he does. Okay. So this device right here, as the piston goes up, this little rod goes up and down. And then he has a device that moves the board side to side. And it traces out this kind of shape that, it, I mean, these still exist on older tractors today. If any of you have looked at the older tractors, they have these pressure volume diagrams. Um, okay. So this is something that he seemed to invent on his own. It doesn't seem particularly exciting. It allows him to know the efficiency. It ends up becoming a big thing in the, actually in the history of science because Carnot and other people that develop the field of thermodynamics, they're using these diagrams to figure out like, the four cycles of a heat engine, and it becomes a big deal. They apply calculus to it, and you can use the actual curves to tell a lot about the different systems of an engine. But I'm interested more in how other scientists thought, well, look, if you can hook up a pressure valve and record the workings of an engine, why can't you do the same thing with the, the human arteries, or the human heart? And so this is a, a kind of graph developed by Ludwig, um, Carl Ludwig, and he was the first person to develop this. This measures blood pressure and other physiological responses. So even today, when you do blood pressure, you might notice it's in a strange unit of millimeters of mercury. But that's because Ludwig was using a manometer, a little mercury-filled tube, um, to measure this. And he was doing all kinds of interesting experiments, playing music, seeing how people's blood pressure responds to music, responds to water eating, responds to drugs. So the beginning of the chemical testing of drug use, like how does it affect different systems of the body, respiration, blood pressure, was being used by this device. Um, and in fact, a lot of the things he has on his device, another big problem was how do you make sure that this drum rotates uniformly? Like how do you get something to move very uniformly in an engine? And Watts used a device that he had seen on windmills, what's called a governor. Um, it, it works on the principle of you've seen an ice skater, as they bring their arms in, they get very fast when they're twirling, right? As they stick their arms out, they get very slow. So this is a device, it was on that big steam engine where it usually has balls, in this case it's brass pieces, that as it starts to get too fast, these swing up and slow it down. If it gets too slow, they swing down and speed it up. So like, we'll see steam engine parts, and you'll see this in all kinds of little, if you open up a little electric engine today, there's also one of these watts governors inside it. But I'm interested in this idea of a stylus attached to record some phenomenon you know, whether it's blood pressure, the workings of a steam engine. Um, in the 1850s, uh, a Frenchman named Martinville developed this item, which is the photonograph, which was um, based on the human ear. He's like, why couldn't you speak into a cone with a membrane with a stylus attached um, and record sound itself? And so these are the first recordings we have of sound. He scratched them on smoked uh, glass, glass plates. Um, they've actually done computer coding to try to transfer this back into sound. So if you want to know what's the first thing you can hear recorded sound, it's, the, it's him reading, I forget what, a particular poem in French, like in 1848 or something like that, on there. Um, 
But this is going to lead to the phonograph, to the record player, right? in important ways. Um, again, not to take anything away from the genius of Edison, it's to recognize what is the genius or creativity that he's doing, which is he's taking this idea that's developed from steam engines to monitor engine pressure and how they work. It's been applied to physiology and the human body. Um, and he's thinking, well, you know, the ear works this way. Why couldn't I create a device that um, would transfer sound waves and just with a stylus scratch it on to originally tin foil? And then later it uses particular kinds of resins. Um, one of the things that's also interesting when you study these kinds of evolutionary things is that people aren't really sure what it's going to be used for. When we get into this thing about the social impact versus the technological development. So he develops a, a really important new device, but he's not sure what it's important for. And so um, originally you can see here the phonograph, the talking machine. This is a piece that Edison himself wrote for the North American Review, listing the 10 uses of his machine. Was first developed in 1978, so letter writing and all kinds of dictation without the aid of a stenographer, um, phonographic books, uh, so that for the blind, um, teaching and elocution, which I love here, reproduction of music, number four, not a lot of fanfare about it, just one of many options, along with a family record. I love this preserving the sayings and the voices and the last words of dying members of the family. Another favorite one, clocks that should announce in speech the hour of the day, so you just have a record player there. 11 o'clock, time to get moving. <laughs> 12 o'clock, time to do this. Preservation of life. But you see, there's all these educational, mostly commercial and business purposes to it. Uh, the idea of that, although I do actually, number 10 is to me really fascinating. Connection with the telephone, so to make that instrument an auxiliary. So basically that your telephone would transcribe, record your conversation onto a record player. Um, and it reminds me of other attempts. The telephone originally starts out as a point-to-point -point business communication system, and they're not really sure that it's going to be a network or used by ordinary people, but there's a lot of um, push and pull about how to develop that system. And there was even an attempt to develop the phone network into a form of entertainment, um, kind of like a cable box. It would play music, you could dial a particular channel, and your telephone would play like jazz music or would have the news. Uh, basically, before the radio, they're like, why don't we turn the telephone into mass, um, mass uh, entertainment rather than just point-to-point -point communication? So any device has many possible uses. And so one of the interesting things of studying the history of technology is how people figure out a particular use. And sometimes you find paths that would have been very interesting that just didn't get developed for financial or technical or personal reasons here. But yes, the main goal was kind of business. Um, here is an image of some of the first early ones. I'll draw your attention to, does the form remind anyone of? It's sewing machine. Sewing machine, yeah, right. They're using, it's actually treadle powered. Like before battery power, um, they're just like, let's use a treadle. And they had decades and decades of experience of using treadles very successfully combined with flywheels to produce uniform, consistent motion to create that revolving. Because it was used, obviously this is kind of modeled on, and they're probably using a lot of the technology from Singer and others, but also um, people like Edison, lathes were often treadle powered. A lot of the machinery used in the shop were treadle powered, so they had this kind of long tradition. But again, we see that kind of skeuomorphism, the drawing on what you know. Um, so let me turn, so anyway, so those are some of the, and we'll, I'll come back actually to the steam engine, but I just want to point out these kind of unexpected ways in which a device like a pressure valve indicator um, opens up the door to all these other possibilities that are unexpected and unanticipated. Um, now bicycles are not something near and dear to my heart. It's something students use all the time. I feel like we now are living through an age with an explosion of newer types of bicycles. But I feel like in general, you know, the modern bicycle was confined to just two or three types. A 10 speed, a mountain bike, a regular bike. There wasn't a lot of diversity. And so a lot of times for students and for myself, it's really exciting to go back into the history of bicycles and see all the different forms they took, all the different technical challenges. So let me see here. I have a little video. Of it. That is jaunty music, but I think I've turned it off. You'll see the first ones were designed like horses with saddles, you know, uh, looking like hobby horses. This is just a short minute video. But this is also designed by wheelwrights and uh, people who did wagons, so you'll notice the wheels, the structure in the early years have that. 
This version built on railroads with their kind of linkages. Mm. Your favorite, right? The high wheeler. years and a minute. <laughs> but yeah, so we see a lot of these issues, they're dealing with several challenges. One, how do you make a ride that doesn't shatter people's bones, that is as smooth, you know, smooth as possible on the kind of surfaces that we're dealing with. Um, how do you create motion um, in terms of, which isn't an easy thing, it's not clear, like, okay, you have a wheeled device, there's not a lot of tradition of wheeled devices being powered with cranks or pedals. What should you use? Um, should you use a treadle, like in your Singer sewing machine? Or should you, you know, this is a device that uh, tries to do treadle power. You push up and down like on a little Stairmaster or something. And it has linkages that are based on like what you'd see like on a railroad. You know, the links that connect wheels, so this kind of crankshaft um, system. Um, this device is the kind of the, the most fun to talk about. Uh, they're sometimes called the penny farthing or the ordinary or the bone shaker or bone crusher. I can't remember what his nickname, right? Um, this device became very popular. It was a struggle over what the bicycle would be. So this was a device that appealed to young men who wanted high speed, high I guess stakes, high um, drama, because it's very easy to take a header in this, like if this wheel hits something, because the center of gravity is right over the wheel, and right on the front. So it's a particularly unstable device. It doesn't much matter to the macho male culture that's using it. This is like extreme sports, or like skateboarding, right? The fact that it's dangerous is not a problem. It is for many other people who are looking at the bike as potentially something that they might use. So we see this with technologies. I was trying to get out a little bit of the telegraph. Would it be a device for specialists, or would it be something that everyone could use? Or the example of the telephone, is it just communication, or is it like mass entertainment? What do we want this device to do, and what technical problems do we face? Um, so this one, the reason why it has very big wheels are for two reasons, actually. One is that it gets you speed. So they're not using any gears or anything like that. So the bigger the wheel, the bigger the radius, and the faster you go. Right? So we'll see. It takes it to extreme in my favorite bike of all time. A three meter ordinary, right? It has to be mounted with probably like a fire ladder or something like that, and a team of people. Um, so that's at one end. But so it gives you, like, the bigger the wheel, the faster you can go, right? <clears throat> so that's what's leading to this one evolutionary line of a bicycle that gets almost kind of Slightly ridiculous. It also allows for a smoother ride. The smaller the wheels are, the more you feel the jolting and stuff. So when people tried devices like those early ones with wheels that are like today's size, it just bumped and shaked, it went slow, it was a poor ride. Um, let's watch a little video uh, of some penny farthings in action. Because this is what they were used for, kind of racing. Racing. Oh, what? Yes. I keep trying to get Grinnell College to get us one of these. <laughs> the tech class needs a lab component. Bicycles like this. So. Luckily, bicycles have always been widely admired and liked, and so there have always been collectors of bicycles. So if you want to think almost like a paleontologist, we have a perfect record of specimens of all the different evolutionary links and things, widely available at various museums and collectors. Um, but there were different ways to solve it. So one thing that was very popular were these rotary devices, which involved two small wheels uh, to provide balance, and then one offset really large kind of giant wheel to provide speed and more stability. And you have a person over on the right riding that. You have another device I love, the die cycle. So you have two large wheels, but balanced with a person in the middle using, again, another kind of like a treadle device to power it. Um, Here's another thing. We have lots of uh, devices with multiple seats. So it wasn't clear whether the bicycle would be a solitary thing that you would do or whether it was a means of transport. Lots of ones that have like pieces on the back to carry like, wagons or to tow things. The military was interested in a series of bicycles they tried to develop that would link one into another so you could have a chain of like 40 bicycles riding all together that would be like connected. Like if you've ever seen a parent with a little child that has an add-on, like the military was developing ones of those. There's just a great array of devices, and one of the assignments I have students do is to go into the um, patent records, which are all digitized now on Google. They're like, you need to find a strange bicycle, or 
one um, that has a purpose that you never thought of and explore why it was created, who created it, what groups were promoting it, like what kind of issues did it solve, and what kind of technical challenges did it face. Um, you'd think pneumatic tires would be a, a one answer to the problem of kind of balance, and so air filled tires, and those do develop, but they actually develop because they get better speed. They're originally kind of dangerous, they would blow out, they had a lot of slides, side slippage. If any of you have ridden over gravel or dirt, you know that pneumatic tires, you know, tires can become dangerous that way. Um, so they actually enter the bicycle scene in a different way. But all of these are trying to deal with uh, moving the center of balance somewhere else. Um, this was another popular device that was seen as kind of a compromise, and it's not easy to climb onto. It's a large device, but it has the big wheel on the back um, so that you're not likely to do a header that way. It kind of changes the balance. And it has these really interesting kind of treadles. Um, this was a very popular bike, the geared fastle. It was kind of one of the most popular for non-racer, non-macho people. And to demonstrate how stable it was, I love this, they rode one down the steps of the Capitol here. I really hope that this person with the ordinary does not try that. I don't know if they made him go down too and fall or, or not. But, um, and I'm just going to show a quick video, because um, just as an example of, kind of, again, these linkages. And James Watts' steam engine. I think I mentioned this in the first session. One of the things that he loved that was just his creativity was devising a, a sun and planet gear. So rather than use an ordinary crank, he devises one in which you'll see it on his bicycle, basically. So this is something, in some ways this is a descendant of a steam engine. So if you watch, there's a circular round gear that goes around, and so it's a way to translate up and down motion into circular motion. So this is someone, so on this popular bicycle, they're using the kind of exact system that Watts developed. Um, he developed it because the ordinary crank was patented and he kind of wanted to challenge you to want to pay the money. And, and instead he liked the aesthetics of it. He liked, engineers love creative solutions and they sometimes find some things more elegant than others. So he created this. But again, treadle motion was what a lot of people were used to because they were used to sewing machines, lathes, all kinds of equipment. So it was the natural way. What's unnatural actually, physiologists will tell you, is the human body doesn't do circular motion well at all. So running your feet in a circle was kind of strange to people um, at the time. And so we see you know, them dealing with that issue. But what eventually does come around is the safety bicycle, as it's kind of called. So it probably looks a lot like a modern device. They decide to um, put the person in the middle, but to make it less awkward for their feet, they use a chain, which also gives them some more gearing power in order to run a set of pedals um, back and forth. Although, I guess one of the things I tell you is that it can be really easy to tell a quick story of like, well, we, you know, we went through experiments and we were always heading to here, but it was never clear that this would be the outcome. And there were, like I said, decades and decades where other models were more popular, serving different social groups. This one became especially popular because of the role of women um, who embraced bicycling. And I have this quote up here, which is quote I really enjoyed from Susan B. Anthony about the importance of bicycles to women. I think this could be extended to the working class as well. Like Orson Welles has a great book, Wheels of Change, a novel about working class people who get bicycles and leave London to ride to the countryside. You know, for people that couldn't afford horses, which is the vast majority of people, the idea of being able to move yourself and just ride anywhere was a potentially transformative experience. Um, and so this, this bicycle, which is really the product of about 50 years of technical back and forth, but also social negotiation, groups saying, we want bicycles that serve us. We want bicycles that are safe, that are steady, that work well, um, produces you know, this kind of important item. Yes? How soon did brakes come in? Okay, <laughs> good question. Yes, I was talking about the challenges of speed, vibration, things like that. Brakes, when did brakes come in? They come in later than you would expect. A lot of the different early devices, like the ordinary stuff, do not have brakes. Other ones start to develop them, and they start to develop them from trains and from other items that have, you know, so they start using hand brakes. Um, I'm trying to remember when the chain, like turning... Has a hand brake. Yeah, no, she has one here. So by 1890s, I believe most bicycles, these safeties, that's one of the features are equipped. But I'm pretty sure that a lot of the earlier ones do not have um, those kinds of items. Uh, yeah. Yes? I 
Yeah. Yeah. Just for yeah. Okay. Got to talk into it. Uh, I know it's a bike here for the women. Why don't they start putting a cross across the top for men? Oh, you write the cross. I, I always thought that was wrong. That should have been a man's because sometimes you can hurt vital organs on the cross. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's a good, so the question, I don't know when the, but it is a, it's an interesting question about how certain technologies get gendered, right, to be different. And, um, I think about even just the example of buttons, like men's and women's shirts have the buttons on a different side because the idea is, again, one of these long holdovers that women would have been assisted in dressing and would have had these Victorian gowns that had you know, hundred buttons, and so they're, they're made to be used by someone facing the person rather than otherwise. So I don't know. I mean, there's a, what I know a little bit more about is the debate over dressing and the concern about women, whether they should wear... Here's another example of skeuomorphism. The first bikes, I don't have pictures, but the first bikes for women were designed for them to ride side saddle. Like they were, of course. Right, so because they were using treadle motion, that was more, more possible. Very hard to do a rotary motion on one side. So there were side saddle bicycles for women, or a lot of double bicycles where the woman would ride side saddle. There was an attempt at like kind of what they called rational dress reform that was going on this time that women shouldn't wear the elaborate Victorian gowns, but could possibly wear pants or other more streamlined, less ornate things. And so there, that's going on during this time. And these women are wearing more simplified dress, but they're not wearing pants. You will see women sometimes wearing. I'm assuming that that lower bar has to do with the issue of skirts, climbing on, stuff like that. But, you know, frankly, I don't know enough. I don't, does anyone else know about the difference or when the crossbar? Um, I'm not sure the function either. Of, I mean, there's a lot of debate about this, the diamond frame, and there's a lot of attempts to create a spring. You'll see a lot of strange bicycles that have all kinds of vibrational spring things. But I'm not sure when this gets, becomes the kind of locked-in pattern. But, and I don't know why that crossbar is there for men, because it doesn't seem safe particularly. Maybe it's more st stronger function. Yes. But the same thing, do you know uh, that I mean, most of, the, of these bicycles you show did have that crossbar? Okay, yeah. And then, so this is the innovation. This is the innovation that's coming through, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And it is, yes, yes. It's a dry weather bike, obviously, because there's no bumper on it or no. Yeah, no cover okay, no fenders, right? Yeah. No, and so there's a lot of the, yeah, a lot of like micro innovations about what to devise, and um, there were different uh, variations about the width of tires and things like that. Like today, we see more popular the really fat tires that are used for like sand or can do off. I mean, all of these things were up for negotiation because no one really knew. I guess one of the big things I think is no one knows what a bicycle is supposed to do, or supposed to look like, or supposed to become. So it's a long process of trial and error, and a, but of also different groups, and not everyone has say. This example, I'm talking about how women, um, older people, others were able to kind of succeed in creating the demand for a safety bicycle that met their needs. There are a lot of technologies that don't meet the needs of large parts of the population because the designers and the manufacturers aren't interested in catering to their particular needs or demands. So, um, like, let me transition to the story of the typewriter, just as a way to kind of get into some of these issues. Um, typewriters are, yeah, okay. Typewriters are really fascinating devices, um, but they've also, they come up, and I mentioned these lawsuits about monopolies, and as people, economists and others are thinking about the dangers of being locked into devices, um, the typewriter has become a kind of iconic story, a little bit like the VHS Betamax, about how we sometimes get um, locked into particular configurations or technologies. And here, what people are most interested in is the seemingly random pattern of keyboards that all of us, this is a keyboard that I imagine almost everyone in the room is familiar with or uses, that they sometimes designate by the first letters QWERTY, Q-U-Q-W-E-R-T-Y. Why is that the device that not only is used on every typewriter than every keyboard, but when you open your phone and you get an alphanumeric keypad, it still has that, it still tracks us today. Why do we have that? And most hauntingly, is it the most efficient or the best system? I see some people nodding no, yes. The, the, uh, they did it that way because they didn't want, if, if they were commonly used keys, they didn't want to write next to them. The uh, most commonly used keys had to be separated because if they struck two keys, they, they'd lock when, you, when they went up. Okay, great, yeah, so you, so, and some of you may have heard of this. This is like one of the more 
kind of public stories about technology, right? So the, the, the early designs we have here, some key things, that these, you're pressing letters that were most common next to each other that would get stuck right. as they move together, right? So, and there are a lot of different ways to solve that problem. Um, and a lot of different, I mentioned this before, that uh, actual pianos played one of the first models in thinking about what a keyboard could look like. And so this is uh, one of the first kind of typewriters. Uh, I've had this issue. There, there are so many, and I won't go into like the bicycles, all the different versions, but there, sometimes the bars were upstroke, so they hit from underneath. The downside of that is you can't see what you're typing until you turn the page over. But that was one system, and it actually avoided the problems. There were things called grasshopper ones, which the key sticks out, like, a, like almost like a praying mantis leg, and kind of goes over. There are like dozens of different mechanisms and devices to solve this problem of jamming keys, or what is the best layout. Um, I mentioned about the stenotype. This comes out of that world of these keyboards. People realize, you probably have heard of stenographers at courts that type, right? But they push multiple keys together to create words. They can type much, much faster. They can do 275 words a minute. Um, and I think the record is 375 words per minute. Wow. So these are people that can go very fast, but they require very specific training. So we get into this issue of how much training do you need versus, versus accessibility. So the original keyboards were alphabetical, just A, B, C, D, E. Um, those anyone could use. You don't need to have a system, right? And we're Part of this is also about the rise of touch typing, like people learning how to teach like not looking at the keys. Um, but Christopher Scholes, who designed the QWERTY keyboard, he originally designed what he thought was an efficient layout as far as putting um, the keys where they are easiest for your hands. One of the problems with QWERTY is you do, I think, 75% of your typing on your left hand. And if you're not left-handed, that's not good. You do a lot of typing, like moving of your fingers. So he designed other keyboards, but QWERTY worked because it was a purposely inefficient system so that people would not type fast and would not make the bars <laughs> crash. Um, also, the sales department at Remington really liked it because you could type out the word typewriter on the first line, so that kind of sales gimmick approach. But this is where we get into the issue that raises like bigger questions, which is like the system that we all use to enter information today, is it really based on the kind of marketing gimmick or based on a decision to make it purposely inefficient because the because of a problem with gears in the 1870s like is that how and is that a broader issue about how technology works that we do things and we have devices um, here's another kind of one there's all these different ball typewriters there are typewriters with um, various dials like we saw on the continent here um, I'll put another plug the Grinnell Historical Museum also has lovely typewriters uh, in their collection too. Um, this was Christopher Scholz, what he thought was his best design. Like he designed this. Um, he's like, you need to replace QWERTY with this. And they're like, no, QWERTY is popular. People have learned to use it. We don't care if it's not as good. We're sticking with this. And so it's an interesting story that the designer of QWERTY spent the remaining years bemoaning the fact that he, he designed better systems, but they would never be adopted. And again, that's something you can hear technologists in a lot of fields talk about. Um, there was also, some of you may have heard of the Dvorak keyboard. Um, which uh, was designed in the 30s by a professor. It was tested out by the U.S. Navy during World War II. It supposedly increased typing by 70%. Um, it's an option on all computers today, actually, now. Interestingly enough, the hardware problem isn't an issue. Like any of you can go into your settings on a computer and switch it to the, to the um, Dvorak setting. But all of us are used to one way. How many people want to get used to something different? So this, this question about what they, you know, economists will call it network effects, but when we all agree and spend time and invest in one system, we don't want to switch to another system, even if we think that other system might be better, potentially. And that's a big problem for a society that believes in the free market and believes that the best thing always wins out in competition. That's not always clear with technology. And the last thing, and I will yeah, end in just a minute here, an example closer to home, too, is refrigerators. Um, Ruth Cohen, who's a historian of technology, did this great piece on um, a lost artifact, a path not taken, which was the gas compression refrigerator. So there's basically two ways you can do refrigeration. You can do an electric compressor that handles the vaporization and condensation, or you can do gas, um, gas absorption. You basically light a flame, you uh, heat up ammonia, it's then absorbed in the liquid water, um, and that 
condenses and cools, and it creates a pressure difference, so it moves the liquid throughout the system. So all you need to really kind of keep in mind is that it has no moving parts, no engine, nothing. You can't really break. It's a system that has no noise. Um, it seems far superior to the electric, and many of you remember how loud refrigerators used to be. Wired today. And you know how much compressors can break and how they put a life on a refrigerator. So why don't we have gas absorption refrigerators? Uh, they still use them in Europe, and they were used in the U.S. And she has a careful history about how General Electric purchased all the rights for the electric compressor. They owned and were selling electric generating equipment to the central stations. They weren't interested at all in a gas absorption fridge. They weren't in the business of gas. And they certainly weren't in the business of selling an item that didn't need repair. Um, so there are different ways in which manufacturers have to make these decisions. And so I leave us with this, too, that we don't all get choices in like, how the technologies were developed. We don't, you can't walk into a store and ask for one of those bicycles or one of these gas absorption fridges. Um, so um, even if the evolutionary perspective is about the collectivity and how we all contribute, I think it's also important to remember that there are choices and there are things that kind of die out in technology, some of which maybe are worth um, studying in the past and remembering, and maybe someone will bring it back. So I will end there. I'm sorry, I've run close out of time. But we have a, maybe a couple minutes left yeah. for questions. Yeah, sure do. One thing I also want to show is this image. The original refrigeration, which is another path not taken, was really large units that were put in the basement, and they piped the refrigeration up to whatever unit you want. So you could take your grandmother's secretary cabinet or whatever, and actually turn it into a refrigerated glass fronted store. Or you could buy special equipment designed for yourself. So, so again, whenever we study the past, we, dis we discover all these paths that might have been, too, which I think is important for us. So, okay.